say yes because when I get here I'm treated royally and get a chance to talk to people and share views and thoughts. So thank you very much to the bilateral U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce for uh, hosting me this time around and I'm trying to remember I think it was almost two years ago since I was last in Houston so it's been far far too long. I will try to do better since I am on the board I will definitely try to be here more often. Um, the topic that I'm going to try to tackle today is, uh, is one that I think all of us are are watching and it's certainly many moving parts as we speak. If you uh, watch the news this morning, there was additional uh, tragedy, tragedy out of Libya with, with more attacks. But the whole Middle East seems to be going through a, a really a prolonged era of turmoil. I'm going to argue this morning that it's a new era. It doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily easier, uh, but hopefully in the long run it will be better. So um, what I would like to do this morning, and I hope we will have the time to also share comments and questions because I'd like to hear very much what you have on your mind. And I know that many of you have people in the region, so you're probably hearing things maybe a little differently than what I'm, what I'm hearing. But I want to cover a little bit about what happened in Tunis and Egypt and what I think is going to happen in Tunis and Egypt. And then I'd like to go through some of the key countries and what, wh what I see going on, will it necessarily go in a similar path or in a different way? Then talk a little bit about the region, the impact within the region, the international response, and then maybe conclude with some thoughts. Um, really, if we, looked at the, if we look at the Middle East today and for the last many, many decades, we see a very similar model everywhere we looked, whether they were kings, presidents for life, uh, tribal leaders who had come into power, there was not a defined way for leadership change. It was either coups uh, for within the family, military coup, or assassination or natural death. And assassination and coup seem to be uh, the most common way, but they didn't happen that often. So you have these people that have just been there forever. Uh, Qaddafi, 40 years, uh, Mubarak, 30 years, and so on. And for a very long time, I think many of uh, the, especially from the West, talking to friends and allies in that region, Region, whenever we try to promote, cajole, uh, encourage movement towards political participation, the response that we very often got was, well, it's either us or the radical Islamists. Take your pick. And it was, it was kind of put to us uh, in very black and white terms, uh, exaggerated, obviously, by people who are trying to stay in power. But not only to the outside world, I think even within those, their countries, uh, I remember an Egyptian uh, colleague of mine who once said to me, well, you know, the devil you know is better than the one you don't know. So she was not going to uh, advocate change from Mubarak because she feared the Muslim Brotherhood. So this was kind of a mantra uh, that we heard. And uh, people in the region really despaired that they would ever see change. They just didn't see a way, a mechanism. And the ones who agitated, of course, very often ended up in jail. What we saw in Tunisia and Egypt, and the reason I was very uh, proud and thrilled to see it happen, was that unlike what we had been told for decades, it was not your radical Islamists who went into the streets. It was really a popular all across the board. We saw them for ourselves uh, and, you know, on TV. Where they were interviewed. Uh, I had live reports from many friends, women my age, who were spending the night in, in Medan Tahir. You know, 20 years ago, I would have never thought they would do that. But they were out there, and they said to me, well, we're here because our kids are here. One of them said, I'm a mother, and I have two of my daughters here, so I'm not going to leave them. I'm out here also camping out with them. So it was really, a, in my view, something extraordinary. It's just something that does not happen, particularly in that part of the world where you see young men, women, older men, women, and also being out in the streets and <laughs> literally camping out. So the, there was a passion there that I had not seen. I had kind of despaired as well that people would just wait for something to happen and they would not take the reins of change into their own hands. And I was really thrilled to see that they did, both in Tunis and in Egypt. Um, of course, when you make change, then hopefully you will be responsible for seeing the change through and, 
and be accountable for what happens afterwards. But I think certainly the, you know, the mantra of it's either us or the radical Islamists was discredited by what we saw. It does not mean that they've gone away. They are, for, they are social forces throughout that part of the world. And they will have to be involved and they will have to be brought in. Hopefully the radical elements will not. But certainly Islamists, conservatives of Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Islamic Action Front in Jordan, they've been there for a long, long time. And there's no way to ignore their presence. So they're going to have to be brought into the system. And instead of working outside the system and trying to break it down, hopefully we will see a um, more constructive role. The other, uh, I think, new uh, that we saw in the movements in both Tunisia and Egypt was the role of the social media. And while the internet penetration in Egypt is not all that huge, nevertheless, uh, for years, for example, people, especially the educated young elite, they set up that Facebook page. I don't know if any of you managed to uh, look at it. It was called We Are All Khaled Saeed. Did anybody see that? Khaled Saeed was a young Egyptian who two years ago, he was a blogger, and he had gotten hold of a video of the Egyptian security forces, uh, a bunch of them getting together and divvying up some drugs that they were going to resell on the market. So he put that on the internet. And so they targeted him. And two weeks later, he was walking out of his, out of his building. And they literally beat him to death right in the front, uh, the lobby of the building. And he, he was, they, were, they were taken, uh, pictures were taken by s cell phone and ended up on, on, on the internet. What that told a lot of Egyptians was that the police had reached the point of impunity. I mean, they just felt they could kill somebody in the middle of a lobby of a building and get away with it. And so for a year, they put up this Facebook page called We Are All Khaled Saeed and agitated to the point where the Mubarak regime actually had to try these two, so, two security police, the thugs that killed him. But they ended up with you know, ridiculous sentences. So social media had a role, but I think also just mobile phones, the internet in general, not just Facebook and Twitter. But it really was. Um, and when the Egyptian government shut it down for the first three days of the demonstrations, it was, I think, probably the first time in history a whole country just went black. You couldn't call in. I couldn't call in. I couldn't send emails to anybody. Um, the reasons for the for the uprisings, obviously not only in Tunisia and Egypt, but maybe throughout the Arab world, are very common. They're very similar grievances, economic issues, social political issues, disenfranchised youth populations, very large youth populations. I mean, Saudi Arabia, the statistic is astounding when you think of 70% of the population is under 30. Uh, in Egypt, a little, uh, not as high, but still very high. So. I, what I think is important to remember is that we can't assume that they will happen the same way. Uh, Egypt and Tunisia, yes, have very similar uh, kind of track in the way how quickly the, the dictators were thrown out. But I think you have to remember the Middle East. Every country is so different, different regimes, different social systems, very different institutions. And therefore, we will see a different process. And we will probably see very different uh, results as well. Um, what was the spark? Everybody talks about Mohamed Bazizi in Tunisia and uh, certainly the police day demonstration that kick-started everything in Egypt. And I wanted to just add one point on that because Bouazizi, of course, was very dramatic, uh, killing himself and putting himself on fire. But there was also a humiliation aspect that I think played very, very strongly in the Middle East and, and on, the, on the media. That he was humiliated. Not only was he, you know, he had no uh, economic way of making a living. They came and took away his vegetable card, but they slapped him, they humiliated him. And that was a factor that I think really angered uh, people and played very strongly on emotions. Same thing with January 25th. January 25th in Egypt was police day. I mean, the most hated institution in Egypt is the Mukhabarat, the internal security services. Uh, and they had become so powerful. And for, for the Mubarak regime to dedicate a day in their honor was probably just you know one, one step too far. And so they picked January 25th as the day to start the demonstration. And they, they, they expected people, maybe 1,000 people, to show up. And they ended up with, as we all know now, 20,000 and beyond. And then, of course, each day it got more. So um, what I saw, certainly, in, in following Tunisia and Egypt also, that I think has a huge impact is the, there's a sense of empowerment. It's like all of a sudden people realized we can make a change. 
if we are willing to die, if we are willing to um, mass ourselves in significant numbers, even a very powerful regime like the Mubarak regime can be brought down. And I think that has created a sense of euphoria, which it has uh, the downside of that is, of course, you, then you get very high expectations. But at the same time, I think it's a, it's a great lesson learned in terms of civil society and the ability of people to dictate their future if they can find a common cause that brings them all together. So breaking the fear barrier, especially in countries like Egypt and Tunisia, which were extremely brutal in the way the police force uh, controlled any social unrest, literally uh, a gathering of more than five people is not allowed. I remember when uh, I happened to be in Egypt in February when Mohammed al-Baradai arrived and he was being, you know, really feted as kind of the, the savior. Uh, but for some reason, they, they kind of picked on Baradai as somebody who could maybe uh, come in with some fresh thoughts on Egypt. But the, the funny thing I tell the story is because, because of the law not allowing more than five people to congregate, there were messages all through Facebook and Internet and on Twitter, go to the airport to meet al Baradei, but don't go in more than four people at a time <laughs> so, to congregate so that they wouldn't get arrested. Um, with Tunisia and Egypt, obviously the work has just started. So I think it's important to remember Mubarak is gone, Ben Ali is gone, but the regime is still very much there. You don't dismantle a regime by just taking out the head. Uh, there will be a lot of institutions that have vested interest, uh, the police force. The military in Egypt is going to be quite, I mean, it's seen as the as the one institution that is now s stabilizing the country and I think they've done actually quite a good job for um, a military institution led by uh, Tantawi who is very much a Mubarak supporter. So they're, in spite of that I think they're doing very well but one has to remember that they also have a lot of vested interest in the way the system is run now especially on the economic front, and I'll get to that later uh, with the Egyptian military. But building democratic institutions is going to take a long, long time. And although they're all talking now about elections for president, for parliament, you know, the electoral laws are not in place, procedures are not in place. Elections in Egypt, for example, have always been chaotic and now will be very difficult to put together in a way that will hopefully allow for many of these new forces to field candidates and to feel that they have a, an even playing field. Tunisia, I think I'm a little more optimistic because I think it's just a little more manageable there. A country of 10 million is a neighborhood in Cairo. That's the comparison I have to give you. Uh, so I think Tunisia has a slightly better chance of success uh, going through this period without too much trouble, but both are going to be going, I think, through many ups and downs.